Ever wonder what it's like to be an athlete on the world's biggest stage? What really goes on inside the village? Let's find out. Legends with Bevo, the road to Tokyo. Thanks to Anytime Fitness Flanel, Renalake Electrical Services. Two-time Olympian and also author of Tall Tales, Chris Anstey, great to have you on Legends with Bevo, the road to Tokyo. Mate, what a win by the Boomers on Saturday night, their first ever bronze medal. Obviously, you know, been doing it for so long, finished fourth, I think fourth or four or five times. As a former Beamer yourself, uh, what was it feeling like when that final siren went on Saturday night? Uh, it was a whole range of emotions. It was pride of, of that for that group. And, you know, I, I was, couldn't have been happier for them. It was something that, as you mentioned, four times previous, we'd made the last four and hadn't been able to win a game. Uh, we'd finished fourth each time. And for that group, to take a really decent swing at the US in the semifinals uh, before their athleticism took over, but to regroup and beat a team led by one of the best players on the planet in Luka Doncic was incredible. Um, Paddy Mills was, it was just a game for the ages. You could tell right from the start that he had decided that win or lose was going to be on him. And word came out after the game, of course, that that's exactly what had been discussed, that they were going to put the ball in Paddy's hands and, and ride what he was able to do. But um, wrapped for the guys who've been a part of it and toiled away for, for multiple tournaments now, so Paddy Mills, Joe Ingalls, Aaron Baines, who missed the second half of the Olympics with injury, um, Joe Ingalls, of course. Um, but uh, no, look, I guess the other part was, you know, the game was at 9 o'clock Melbourne time in the evening and. I still remember as a little kid, my parents waking me up in the middle of the night to win, uh, to watch Australia win the America's Cup yacht race of all things because it was such a historical feat. It had never been done before. And for me, the night was about making sure my six-year-old son understood how important this night was. Um, I let him stay up. Um, I talked him through the game. We talked about it after the game. Uh, I wanted to make sure that he remembers last Saturday night and the Boomers winning their first ever medal for many, many years to come because I think it will impact so many people of his generation um, across different cultures as well. And that's the other thing that Paddy Mills and the group have been able to do is just to tie in generations, tie in cultures into their journey. And the Boomers culture has been spoken about a lot, but, uh, a lot, but it was right there to be seen. And that's what true culture is. It was real. We saw 42 points. Uh with Paddy Mills, you just mentioned before, one of the greatest games you'll ever see. I know you've played with some absolute superstars and against some superstars over your career, Chris, but is he now the greatest ever boomer you've ever seen? I don't, I don't like rating them. Um, and yeah, there are so many. Paddy plays different roles on different teams. His role on the boomers is to be that go-to guy, as was Andrew Gaze, as was Shane Hill at times. But in the same breath, I, I still respect the hell out of guys like Nick Kay. I, I love that Josh Green had an opportunity. I think that if you get them in the locker room, they're equal. Um, so I certainly don't like putting one above the other, although their roles are clearly very different. And Paddy's role in these Olympic Games and in the previous were, was very, very important uh, when it came to high minutes, high usage with the ball in his hands. But, you know, one thing I think Paddy absolutely has put himself front and centre of is that leadership and the culture piece. So uh, an incredible individual performance from Paddy in that game, the highest score that anyone in Olympic history has ever scored when, the medal was on the, when a medal was on the line. Um, so it was historical in that sense. Um, but I, I certainly don't want to do a disservice to anyone who's pulled on the green and gold over the generations by trying to rank them. Now you've answered that very well. <laughs> that was a tough question. So, <laughs> and obviously after the game, we saw the emotion with Andrew Gazer and and Paddy both speaking so well. And and you know it's hard not to tear up being a Boomers fan myself, and I'm sure you were as well, Chris. But um, what do you think it meant so much to to Andrew Gazer and and Paddy Mills as well? Just seeing that emotion and having been a Boomer yourself on two occasions. Uh, the path's been so long, um, and at times it had seemed in, insurmountable. Um, we had spoken about for generations now. I, I was a part of a group, and it wasn't the first group, but our goal was to win Australia's first ever medal in an international tournament. We wanted to do it in Sydney, and we failed. 
Uh, we got close previous to that. We got close last time in Rio, uh, agonizingly close in Rio, uh, with a couple of dubious decisions uh, down the stretch. But those guys have been fighting for that for a long time. So we watched with pride. Um, for me, it's it's about those 12 guys and the coaching staff that they put in the hard yards. They were able to do what generations of boomers hadn't been able to do. Um, we all wanted it to happen. I don't think there'd be any boomer who a small part of them wasn't a little bit or even a lot disappointed that they weren't a part of what they were able to achieve because it's special. Uh, it's historic. Um, it, it means a lot to, to those guys. It means a lot for the guys who've gone past to see that it's possible and see that it finally happened. Um, but I think it's going to mean a lot to the generations to come because I think it really rubber stamps the fact that Australia is one of the best basketball nations in the world. We certainly punch above our weight considering how small our population is compared to the rest of the world and, and consider we finished third as well. And um, one thing I felt was really yeah, look, good. You know, you know, you know what, on, on that, I, 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 we've always said that, but I don't agree. I, I think there's, there's not as many people in Lithuania, there's not as many people in Slovenia, there's not as many people in some of those small Eastern European countries that we haven't beaten for a long, long time. I get the population thing, but I think that's part of the boomers' culture is we don't think we punch above our weight. We, we think we deserve to be a heavyweight. Uh, the guys we've got representing us are the best in the world. I don't think we're batting out of our depth. I think we're right there on the pointy end and we deserve to be there. We're, we've fought a long time to be there. Um, that was one of the, the hardest parts generations ago when we kept hearing we're punching above our weight. We thought we deserved to be there. We didn't think we we're out of our weight class. We thought we we're in the weight class we deserve to be in. So it, I know it's a little thing, and I know the, the media have rolled it out for a lot of times, but, you know, I think Australia is one of the countries in the men's and women's that other nations know they have to go through if they're going to win a medal now. And the way Paddy Mills, in his speech as well, acknowledged the past boomers, including yourself and, you know, Andrew Gaze, Phil Smyth, some of the absolute superstars we've seen that have been to Olympics uh, over the years for Australia, I thought it was just wonderful as well, Chris. And, he's, and you know what, that's such a really important part of Indigenous culture of, of indigenous culture that paddy has been able to bring uh, to the boomers. He, he's used basketball as a platform. He's educated people around the globe uh, in San Antonio, where he's been for a long time now. Uh, they had their first Indigenous round or game in San Antonio as a result of Paddy educating people there. He, he educates people who walk into the program and through his actions on the court and the platform he's been given, uh, he continues to educate. So, uh, I mean, it's sometimes it was a very, very important basketball game, of course, historic, but I think, again, the impact of the game and the impact of the messaging around the group will be even bigger. You touched on it earlier as well, the, the game against the US. Um, I was listening to SEM when you were, you were calling the game and we're up by 15 points in the second and I think all of us were kind of just, and crossing our fingers and you kept on saying, you know, it's, it's early days, just just pump your brakes, you know. And obviously we saw what happened in the end with the US going on and, and having that victory. But um, do you feel as though Australia is now taking another step forward and, and you know, gold is that next step for us uh, in Paris and, and we can actually take that next step now knowing that we can take it right up to the US. Obviously it has to be for four quarters to beat them, but do you feel like we're now able to take that next level when, when we look forward to three years' time, Chris? Yeah, I mean, we can compete, of course. Um, I think sometimes in this conversation it gets lost and people forget, yeah, the world's catching up to the US, but the US is still a long way ahead. That There's not another nation in the world that can match their size and athleticism. Um, you, know, you think of the players that the US didn't send to this one. You know, we, we speak about missing Ben Simmons. Um, you know, it's the US at their best are a different level. Uh, they're faster, they're stronger, they're more athletic. They play a different style of game, but to beat the US when it matters uh, requires a team to be almost perfect uh, for, an entire, for, a for an entire 40 minutes. It, it requires them to shoot the ball great, to force the US to play a style of game that they're not accustomed to playing. But as we saw in the semi-final game, it's possible uh, but it's really, really difficult to sustain the level of play to keep the US down. Um, so, yeah, I mean, gold remains a goal. It does. And, and the boys have said that. The coaches have said that. 
Uh, the bronze medal is an incredible moment. That's the bar. Uh, there's a silver medal, there's a gold medal to be won. Um, but I don't think winning a bronze medal guarantees that we win another one. I think we, we have to really recognise this is special. There are so many nations around the world that play basketball and we're one of the top three right now. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're one of the top three next time. We've got to keep working. We've got to keep improving. As you say, as we try to catch up to the United States, other nations try to catch up also and they're trying to catch up to us. So three years is a long time. I can't wait. I'm like, you know, Paris is going to be fascinating to see which of these guys come back, uh, which of the young guys step up, Josh Green, Josh Giddy, Dyson Daniels. You know, does Matisse Thibel come back? Does Ben Simmons make himself available? There are a lot of stories uh, to happen between now and then. You touched on Josh Giddy before. I've obviously taken it number six in the NBA draft. What a super talent he is. Um, what advice do you have for Josh having played NBA yourself and how do you think he's going to go in the NBA? None. Um, it's been a long time. <laughs> uh, it's, it, be careful with whose who's advice you take. I mean, he's going to get a lot of that. but. Josh has got good people around him. You know, his parents will keep him absolutely grounded. Um, he's got the right people around him. And let's go back to your own journey, Chris. Uh, we, you represented the Boomers the very first time in Sydney back in 2000 and unfortunately missed out in 2004 because of injury. And then you, you went to Beijing again in 20, 2008. Um, going back to 2000, when you found out you are going to be representing Australia in the Olympics for the very first time, what was that feeling like and, and who were the first people that you told? I, I couldn't tell you who I told first. Um, what was the feeling like? It was, there was a sense of responsibility about it. Um, you know, you see the devastation, literal devastation of people who miss that team and some great players miss that team. So there's a, a sense of responsibility to represent them, uh, to represent my family, my friends and people who helped me get there. And I guess fast forwarding a number of years now and understanding the journey you take people close to you on when you pull on that jersey, that jersey is incredible. So that, that responsibility, I think, and uh, you know, probably why it made it even more difficult that we weren't able to achieve what we set out to achieve. And that was to win a medal back then. And we got so close. Uh, we had some incredible experiences in Sydney, walking out into the stadium, uh, right up the front because Andrew Gaze was the flag bearer. It was incredible. Uh, interacting with the athletes in the village, uh, watching some of the other events were, were all incredible and, and finding a way to make a run to get to the semifinals was great. Uh, but the overwhelming memory of Sydney is not being able to win that medal, which you know, still sits with you and, and takes a little piece out of you. And you know, even the other night, there's a sense of sadness a little bit, you know, just a small piece of one moment, you know, comes over a little bit. Luke Longley said that the skeletons come out of the closet and dance around a little while. Um, I thought that was a really good way to put it. And the Olympic Village, we love hearing the stories about that. Uh, Rachel Spawn, she mentioned back in 1996 with Atlanta, there was uh, nine McDonald's there and um, a couple of other guys have told me some interesting stories about water fights and all sorts of things. Um, what was your Olympic Village experience like in 2000 and 2008, Chris? It's a little bit different for, for basketball because we played every second day. We started on the first day. We finished on the last day. Um, you know, it's you've got to remove the distractions that are the Olympic Village. You know, it's, it's not like the swimmers where they're done after the first week and they party for the second week or some of the athletes who finish early. So it's a little bit of a different experience, but um, it was eye-opening. It was, yeah, you realise that the people that you've seen on TV across all sports from around the world, they're, they're just like us. They're normal. Uh, you, you observe some of their habits. Um, you get to see them up close. Um, at times you get to have some conversations with some, but, you know, again, our, our competition didn't finish until the very last day, both times, and we're out of the village you know, 36 hours after we finished. So we didn't get, I guess, that celebratory feel of what the village is for some other sports. And Phil Smyth, a mate of mine and a mate of yours as well. And um, it's interesting uh, talking to Phil about, uh, you know, his experience back in the day of being involved with the Olympics and, and how he would have coped with it being postponed. How would have you dealt with that, Chris? I think we're all learning to do it better with everything. Um, 
you know, there are a whole bunch of phrases that corporates are using and that coaches are using. We've heard them all. Um, but it really is trying to control what you're able to control right now. And I think as athletes, we, we learn that really early. Um, you know, we don't have to work for a lot of hours every day, but we've got to make it productive. And so it's, it's about that, I think, is living in the moment, making sure we maximise what we can when we can uh, and being ready for anything. Um, so how would have I handle how would have I handled it? Probably the same way as anyone who's got any other job who keeps getting postponed handles their job. Um, you know, sports people have it pretty easy um, compared to people who are losing jobs and who are really battling financially. You know, everyone who went there is pretty secure in their in their careers and in their jobs. So I think it would have been okay. Really well answered. And I touched on it at the very first start of the show. You've You've now written a book called Tall Tales. Um, tell us a, about the book, Chris, and uh, how we can purchase it. Well, you can, first and foremost, it's chrisanstey.com.au is where you can purchase it. I kept it nice and simple, but <laughs> I, I guess the reason that I wrote it, it was a COVID project. So again, I was trying to maximise what I was able to do through COVID. And the same reason I got into coaching was the same reason I wrote the book. And that was, I know how fortunate I'd been over my career to learn and to be around some incredible people that taught me so many things. And most of the things that taught me didn't necessarily apply to on the basketball court. They applied to how I conducted myself away from the basketball court, how I was able to find something that resembled my own personal best. And I wanted to tell those stories because the, the people who taught me those stories aren't going to be able to tell everybody that should be told those things because they're incredible lessons, they're incredible stories. And so I had the time to, to do it through lockdown and I started sharing some on social media and didn't really have any intention of writing a book but almost got persuaded to do it with the feedback I was getting and so did. Um, I'm really proud of it. Uh, it. It took a long, long time. It was a fantastic process to go through and reconnect with the people in the book, retell some stories remember some stories that I'd forgotten or some details that I'd forgotten and be able to put them into words. And, you know, since I've released it, it's been, the feedback's been a little bit overwhelming in so far as people applying lessons to themselves, finding parallels between what I went through, what they're going through. Even a few schools have called me and messaged me and said they're using it as their term reader for their class, which is, oh, wow. I, I didn't, I didn't see that coming. So it's been a, a really great journey, even for me, putting it together and then talking and telling those stories again. And again, wanting to share what I've learned from some incredible people that won't be able to, to teach those lessons to as many people as maybe this book can reach. And before I let you go, I have a bit of fun. Um, always like asking these sort of questions. Who's the funniest teammate? Um, well, you might have a couple that you've played with in the past and why? Well, the funniest teammate. Um... I, I don't know. There have been so many overseas. It was probably Cedric Sabalos, Martin Mercer. Back, back here, Russ Hinder was finally played with him for a minute, but he was fun. Uh, you know, Jason Smith, when he was young, did some things that continue to make us smile. But, you know, they're probably the funniest person I've been around, the best storyteller is still Brian Gorgian. I mean, ask anyone who's played for Gorge you know, about his storytelling sessions. <laughs> they, he just has the room in stitches for as long as he wants to talk. That's so interesting hearing that because he comes across like such a serious sort of guy and and no doubt he's a successful coach we've seen in the NBL and and now with the Boomers that the players just love him. So it's really interesting to hear that from yourself and and getting a real insight into to Gorge because like I said, you, you seem to be on, on the court. He's so, he's so focused and so serious, but he does have that real lighthearted sight. Yeah, him, which is he, great. He, he does. If he, one of the funny, we had a night with the Melbourne Tigers and he's very close with Bruce Palmer and Al Westover and they're all together in a room and we're having drinks after one of our games and our entire Melbourne Tigers team sat around and probably didn't say a word for three hours but were more tired laughing at their stories than we were from the game we just won. It, it was just one of the funniest nights I've ever been around and those three guys, Brian Gorge and Bruce Palmer, Al Westover, if you ever get a chance to listen to them in a, in a room, do yourself a favour and, and, and make, sure, make sure you get there. 
<laughs> we'll have to try and get him on uh, Legends of Bevo, maybe. That would be pretty cool. So, <laughs> And the most embarrassing moment in your basketball career, Chris? Uh, yeah, well, it's... <laughs> I don't really have any. I mean, when I started, everything was embarrassing. I was seven foot tall. I weighed 87 kilos. I got beat up every day. I mean, it was performance-based. that I wasn't very good. I had to improve really, really quickly. So you, know, you learn pretty quick when you play sport to get a thick skin um, and not too much embarrass me. It's, it happens. It goes away and you forget about it. It's pretty simple. And your toughest opponent of all time and why? Shaquille O'Neal, in my position, he was just the most dominant physical human being I'd ever played against and couldn't move him. And back when I competed against him, he was super athletic as well. So he'd have to be on the top of my list. And finally, three famous people, alive or dead, you'd love to have dinner with, Chris. Who would they be? Oh, well, yeah, well, I wouldn't mind hearing some of Bill Clinton's stories. I feel like he'd be a good storyteller. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I've never really thought too much about it. Um, it always stuns people. I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah well, it's funny because I, I tend to, <laughs> one of my things is I like getting on social media and reaching out to people who I admire and trying to actually organise to do exactly that. And I've had some incredible conversations over the years with people who got back to me, you know, the, the Craig Bellamy's of the world, the Alistair Clarks and those sort of people that you, you find get back to you. So, uh, look, you'd probably want to sit down with, I mean, what's the conversation about? I, I wouldn't mind figuring out how Michael Jackson's head really ticked and see what went on in there. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's it's the storytelling and just it's not necessarily the people who are the best or the smartest. Sometimes they're the most interesting and the ones you want to actually know what happened. You'd, you'd probably love to sit down with someone who knows all of the hidden documents around US history and I lived in Dallas I'd love to know more about JFK and what really happened um, you know things like that I think could be really really interesting if there was any possibility I love it Chris uh, the book is Tall Tales my guest today is Chris Anstey on Legends of Bevo The Road to Tokyo two time Olympian absolute legend thanks so much for joining us for a chat again mate and uh, look forward to speaking again in the future absolutely cheers Bevo